welcome everyone. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Consistency is Key, Best Practices for the F751 NIR Spectrometer. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about the 751. We'll be talking about methodologies that are currently being used. We'll talk about uh, accuracy of the 751 and how we explain that uh, and talk about the different sources of variation uh, that can arise uh, when using the 751. Um, 751 comes in obviously three different uh, configurations right now. Uh, had, there's an avocado quality meter, a mango quality meter, and a kiwi quality meter. Um, and these are each commodity specific. So uh, uh, today a lot of the data will be focused more on the avocado side of things, but the, the principles apply to uh, across all of the, all of the uh, 751 line. Um, I also want to take this time to really thank anyone who's here uh, from the produce industry. I know that uh, things are really hectic for you guys right now. Uh, so um, really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, be here for this webinar. So let me, oops, let me first uh, introduce to you uh, our webinar host for today, uh, Eric Munez Garcia. He uh, is an application scientist. He's the other application scientist here at Felix Instruments. Um, he's got a bachelor's in health, uh, biohealth uh, sciences from Oregon State University. Uh, he's got a lot of experience uh, uh, working in food analytical testing and dietary supplement uh, testing, um, as well as a DNA analysis, um, uh, look, looking at things like uh, uh, identity testing and uh, food fraud, um, uh, FDA label compliance, things like that. So. Uh, he's a great resource to have here uh, and to have uh, working with me at the, at the Felix Instruments and CID Bioscience team. So uh, uh, if you haven't been on a webinar before, uh, my name is Galen. Uh, I am an application scientist here at Felix Instruments. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and a master's degree in food science from Michigan State University. Um, I am an IFT certified food scientist and I previously managed an analytical food testing laboratory um, and also worked as a food safety consultant in the um, uh, produce sector as well as the food manufacturing and cannabis sectors. So I'm really excited to hear to be talking to you guys about the, the F751. So I've already kind of laid out a little bit of our agenda for today, but here's a little more specific uh, uh, look at what we're going to be talking about today. We'll start with uh, the introductions, which we've already mostly gone through. Um, then we're going to go into uh, the comparison of dry matter methodologies. So there's a lot of methodologies out there. We'll talk about those. Uh, then I'm going to jump right into uh, talking about our validation data that we provide for the 751 uh, avocado quality meter as well as the 751 kiwi fruit quality meter. Um, and we'll talk about those, that data and I'll explain the statistics that we used uh, on those uh, to do the analysis um, of that validation data. And uh, if many of you, if you've looked before, uh, this data is available on our website. And so I just wanted to kind of give you guys a clearer image of what the validation uh, means. Then uh, in order to explain uh, the sources of variance, uh, how to uh, you know, increase your accuracy, how to compensate for any sort of biases in your, uh, in your instrument, um, we will go over uh, just some of that information quick and then we'll go into a case study and look at actual real data uh, and explain to you, I'll explain to you how exactly uh, the bias or the offset correction uh, is actually one of your most powerful tools uh, to use um, in order to increase your, uh, your, your precision and your accuracy. Uh, so, and then after that, we're going to go into our question and answer session. And both Eric and I will be available to help answer questions. Um, and any questions that uh, require a more in-depth solution, uh, we are likely going to encourage you to go ahead and just email us directly so that we can address your specific problem uh, more directly and more head-on. So let's start by talking about dry matter methodologies. Uh, so right now in the agricultural uh, community, uh, there is a lot of different methods out there for measuring dry matter. And uh, these include, but are not limited to, 
uh, oven drying uh, through via forced air ovens, convection ovens, there's vacuum ovens, there's halogen lamp ovens. Um, and then there's also uh, dehydrators, which are kind of a, a similar take to the forced air oven, which are very commonly used. Uh, the microwave drying method, there's both manual methods and autom automatic methods. Um, and then there is uh, uh, the freeze drying method. Um, uh, and also lastly, what uh, we're talking about today is NIR spectroscopy, which is what the F751 uses. So I think Eric uh, has a poll for you guys. And actually we wanna hear from you about uh, what methodology you currently use uh, uh, to determine dry matter in your whatever commodities that you uh, specialize in or that you test. So if you, sh you should see a poll on the screen here and go ahead and answer um, whatever you uh, 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 use most commonly and we will go ahead and look at the results of that and kind of talk about uh, what we think about that. So I know that uh, here in, or uh, I know that, but you guys don't, but in our lab at the office, we actually try to uh, um, employ as many of these different technologies as possible to see which one, uh, you know, will give us the best results. And uh, there's a lot of debate out there about, you know, removing moisture from, from food commodities. And so it's really hard to, uh, you know, narrow this down to just, you know, which one of these is, is, is the most accurate because uh, as we'll see in a little bit with some data, um, uh, they can oftentimes provide quite different results. But we'll go ahead and let you guys answer those poll questions. Uh, I know that a lot of you in the avocado community will likely answer microwave. Um, I know that uh, if you're in the kiwi fruit industry, you'll probably answer dehydrator uh, and oven drying uh, for uh, likely for mango. Dehydrator also possible for mango. Um, usually the higher the bricks uh, content or the sugar content in a fruit, the more difficult uh, it is to utilize a microwave because it, it lends itself to burning of the, of the fruit more easily. So do we have uh, results in yet, Eric? Uh, so we have 67% of the polling complete. Um, I'll give it five more seconds. Try to reach 70%. At 70%, I'll go ahead and end polling. If awesome. anyone is not interested in um, providing the information, then that's not necessary. This is optional, but I'll go ahead and stop the polling now. All right. So what are our results here? All right. Okay, honestly, uh, I actually am a little bit surprised. Uh, I wasn't expecting, so you guys all should be able to see these results. Um, the oven came in with the highest number of responses at 42%. Uh, the dehydrator coming in at 15%, uh, microwave at 28%. What surprises me is the near infrared being 23%. Uh, that's, that's really cool to see people embracing the new technology. Uh, and then 18% use it, uh, another method, um, potentially something like freeze drying or another, another type of drying method. Um, so yeah, the oven still uh, is a tried and true method. It's one of the oldest methods that are out there. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people consider it to be you know, kind of this, uh, you know, the standard, since that's the way it's been done always. Uh, but uh, as we, as we'll see in a little bit here, um, there are uh, differences between each method and each method has its own inherent variability uh, due to the fact that it is just extremely difficult to remove water from anything, especially a agricultural commodity without removing non-water components or burning, uh, you know, combusting something on accident and causing a, a chemical change in the fruit itself or the vegetable or whatever it is that you are uh, measuring. Um, and so this is just, this is a, a quick little study we did in our lab. We happen to have uh, these three technologies at our disposal. Uh, and so we just wanted to do a quick uh, kind of anecdotal study um, about, uh, you know, what we, what we would get uh, for differences in dry matter if we ran uh, the same samples uh, across three different 
uh, dry matter methods. And so we did a, dehyd a classical dehydrator method, um, which was just a dehydrator at uh, 60 degrees Celsius, uh, you know, for uh, a minimum of 24 hours. Uh, and then uh, we also happen to have, and we're testing uh, this uh, new technology from Sartorius. It's an automatic microwave. Uh, it's called the LMA220. And so when I say automatic, I mean that you can program in different power levels at different time intervals, and there's a scale built in to the instrument. And so as the uh, fruit or, or whatever commodity we're measuring, in this case, it was avocados, uh, as the avocado dries, um, it actually can detect the change in weight uh, and it'll detect when the fruit actually stops ch losing weight essentially from water. And once it's hit that end point, it'll automatically turn off the instrument and it'll spit out the value uh, of dry matter for you. And, uh, and you can see the dehydrator in that automatic microwave system from Sartorius were fairly similar. Um, then we also tried freeze drying or lyophilization. <clears throat> and with our freeze dryer, uh, the, the, the data showed that uh, our dry matter came out a little bit higher than with the dehydrator and the sartorius. Now, the problem with running studies like this is that, yeah, it'll show us this variability. We really can't determine which one is actually right, which one's accurate. Uh, because, uh, you know, there's just no way to know which one is actually getting out all of the moisture and not getting out, not accidentally taking out uh, non-water components. So, you know, who's to say that the dehydrator or the sartorius um, wasn't actually doing some uh, uh, combusting at that, at that lower heat level and removing more volatiles or removing more, you know, say oil, for example, than the freeze dryer was. So it's, it's a really difficult thing to navigate these different methodologies. And I'll show you now some real data. Uh, this is not to say that our last study wasn't real data, but uh, this is a, an actual study done uh, by a, a third party. This is actually a, a data collected by uh, our, our friend and collaborator, Dr. Jorge Asuna. Um, he uh, is with INAFAP in Mexico, and he was actually looking at uh, the performance of the 751 across uh, multiple different regions, different growing regions in uh, Mexico, as well as looking at uh, 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 looking at different sizes of avocado and how uh, that uh, affects the performance across uh, the, these three different technologies of that are commonly used in the avocado industry. So the 751 avocado meter, the oven method, oven drying method, and then the microwave method, which is like most likely, and, and I think at this point now, is the more popular method to use to determine uh, dry matter content in avocados. And so uh, you can see here that uh, each method is providing uh, a slightly different result. Uh, and uh, what the really key take home here is to look at is to look for the consistency in the method, right? So especially when you look at something like the caliber, the size of the fruit, you want it to be the method to be able to uh, be consistent in uh, across any sort of size of avocado. You don't want that to be another variable that's going to influence uh, uh, the readings of your, of your, of your uh, method. So <clears throat> we can look and we can see that um, both the SM51 and the microwave were extremely consistent and, and how they uh, measured uh, dry matter, you know, across all different sizes of, of avocado. Um, however, the oven, it seems, uh, you know, uh, had quite a bit of struggle um, uh, across uh, the different sizes. And so this comes down to the fact that, um, you know, every methodology is, is totally different and it's not just the technology behind it, but it could also be your uh, uh, technique the technique you're using for for sampling the fruit for you know how you're you know are you are you homogenizing it before you're putting it in the oven you know there's a lot of different factors i can go into uh you know like how consistent this method is what we like about the 751 <clears throat> is that it takes a lot of those confounding variables out of the equation there's no thinking about uh you know how you are um you know uh you know 
are you using a desiccator to let it cool before you weigh it? Are you going to constant weight? Are you, you know, what is your technique for actually sampling the fruit? Uh, and so uh, this, the 751 helps eliminate a lot of those variables. And so it, it, it does allow it to be uh, uh, something that is less uh, technique dependent, although there is technique still involved and I will explain that later on. Um, but it also, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a consistency uh, across, you know, across analysts, across, you know, uh, 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 different, um, uh, you know, users, as long as uh, you're being, you know, consistent in how you, how you tell your, your users exactly how to use the instrument. Um, and that's why the title of this is Consistency is Key, because really it is truly, even, even if you are talking about an, any other method out there, consistency is uh, extremely important. Doing something the same way uh, every time eliminates a lot of uh, confounding variables that can actually uh, really mess up and influence your data. So we talked about the methods. Let's just jump right into talking about some of our validation data. Um, and so, as I already mentioned, this data, uh, we always post every time we come up, come up with a new model, we always like to post our validation data onto our website uh, for just full data transparency purposes. And so I'll take you through and run you through um, uh, these both for the, the data sets for both the kiwi fruit and the avocado. Uh, and then we will, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, hopefully be able to uh, give you a good idea of what metrics we used for evaluation and why we use them. Uh, so this table here, you can see uh, just going through all the columns, there's, we use two different varieties of fruit because that's what we uh, built the model with, both gold and Hayward kiwi fruit. The sample number refers to the fruit number. Uh, so this was 22 fruit uh, in this study. Uh, we uh, took the reference dry matter using the uh, same method that Eurofins uses um, in order to do their dry matter uh, uh, studies on kiwi fruit by taking a, a slice out of the center of the fruit and using a dehydrator. Uh, and so these are the reference uh, values. Um, all this fruit uh, came from a local market in Camas, Washington. Uh, so it was already fully mature. Um, uh, fruit, uh, uh, which uh, is another uh, thing that I, I'll explain later on in this presentation as to why uh, we do it the way we're currently doing it and how we are working to improve that process. But um, so yes, yeah, so we have the reference dry matter column. And then you have these groupings of three columns here in this data. And each grouping of three columns represents data from a single instrument. So when we validate, we don't just use one instrument. We, we use a, a, a wide number of instruments. In this case, I think we use six, uh, five or six different 751 instruments in order to make sure that the model is performing consistently or at least to our standards across all the instruments that, that are tested. And it's not just a fluke that it happens to work on one and then it doesn't work on other ones for some reason. So. Uh, you'll see that the number 19201, that is actually, uh, when you look at the serial number on the back of the instrument, uh, the format always goes 751 hyphen, and then there's a three number code, which uh, represents the hardware version. And then after that, there's a hyphen, and then it'll give you a code like 19201. And that's, that's uh, the unique identifier for our products. And so each of those uh, represents an instrument number. Uh, and in these three columns, we have the predicted dry matter, which is what the instrument told us was the dry matter for that fruit. And then we have the percent error of the dry matter. Now, when I say percent error, this is a relative measurement. So this error is, is actually going to fluctuate based on what the reference dry matter is. So the higher the value of the reference dry matter, then if you have say, let's say for example, 1% error. 1% error when you're measuring something that's 20% will give you a error of, of 0.2, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, if you are, were looking at 1% of something that is 1%, uh, truly if you're measuring something that is 1% and you're looking at 1% error, 
then you get down to extremely low levels of error. So the error actually level changes based on how large the number is for the reference value. And so this can be useful. Uh, it still can be a very useful measurement because it's a good goal to, to shoot for, right? It's a good goal to say, overall, no matter what your number is, what, no matter what value you're measuring, the error will always be less than, than this value. That's a good goal to shoot for. However, it's easier to put in terms of absolute error. And so when I talk about absolute error, that means that we're converting that percent error to a tangible number. Uh, and that number being dry matter percentage. Uh, so uh, when we convert those to absolute errors, we can actually see how many dry matter units or percentages uh, each measurement is off from the reference value. And so at the bottom, you'll see these uh, average columns. And so the average is just showing that uh, across all 22 of these fruit, uh, when we are looking at the average relative error, the percent error, uh, we're getting about 3.3% error. Now 3.3% error for something that measures at 20% dry matter versus something that measures at, you know, 10% dry matter are two totally different uh, uh, things. And so uh, what we're more interested in is the absolute error. So showing that on average, the instrument was reading uh, 0.5 uh, percent dry matter off from the reference dry matter. So the instrument, if you would take a scan and it read uh, any, any typical scan on average, you'll take a scan. If it reads 18%, then our method will read 18.52. Uh, and that's on average. Um, and then if you look at below that, you'll see two different error less than uh, 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 rows here. And so error less than 5%, this is going back to that relative error percentage. Uh, and so we were looking at how many of these, uh, uh, of these samples did, we, did the 751 perform in a way that gave an error that was less than 5% relative error. And for the kiwi fruit model, uh, for this sample set, it was 72.7% of, of the samples had less than 5% error. Um, and then uh, uh, across the board, I think for all of these instruments, um, we never had an error, a relative error that was greater than 10%. Uh, and so that's what it means when 100% of the error, 100% of the samples had an error that was less than 10%. So that's the kiwi fruit data explained, and now we'll go into the avocado data, which has a little bit more uh, 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 statistic, statistical metrics involved. And um, we will be, uh, I am currently working on um, doing some reformatting to make it kind of um, easier to read uh, for the average user. <clears throat> but this is a model validation study for the current avocado model, which is version 11. Um, this was done uh, in March of 27, or sorry, March of 2019 at our lab in Camus. Um, and so uh, they were, this is looking at 29 different fruits, 29 different avocado. And with those 29 avocado, uh, there was four scans taken from each avocado. And so when you look at skipping this top box really quick to go down to the actual data, uh, you'll see a scan number and then a fruit number. So scan one is the first scan on the first fruit. Scan four is the fourth scan on the first fruit. And that's what the 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D designation is. Uh, so each uh, fruit has four scans associated with it. Um, this came out to a total of, uh, due to the fact that we used 10 instruments for this validation study, um, this actually came out to a total of about uh, 1,044 total scans across all instruments for all the fruit. Um, and uh, uh, the average, uh, so going back to the box here on the top, the average dry matter of the fruit was 31.63% uh, dry matter. So that's taking the actual, which is a, the column down below at, right after fruit, the actual is the reference method uh, a way of measuring. So with the reference method, 
um, we utilize dehydrator. Um, uh, and I think actually if this study, uh, 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 we did use the dehydrator as opposed to using uh, the microwave. Um, and so with the actual value, uh, you take all of those fruit, so across all fruit, we, we average that value and we get 31.63% dry matter. Um, now, uh, going back up to the top box, I already explained the reference method. Uh, we, we, uh, it says dried and weighed. Um, obviously, that's a little vague, uh, but uh, for this one, I believe we did use the actual dehydrator. Um, uh, and then we have a reference method error of about 1.6%. Uh, and so that's just looking at the error, uh, the average error between uh, the, uh, the, the values and then the average dry matter value. Um, the uh, results column, uh, I'll talk about in a second on this top box, but first let's go back down to the data. Uh, I know we're jumping back and forth here a little bit. Um, this is why uh, we will be uh, you know, trying to improve the flow of, of this uh, validation data sheet. Um, so what we want to uh, look at is uh, you can see the S uh, and then the forward slash and the N. That stands for serial number. So you'll see that as a shorthand notation for serial number. Um, all of these numbers are associated with an individual instrument, a unique identifier for each instrument. And going down uh, the column is the predicted value for that instrument for that uh, scan of that particular part of the fruit. And so uh, that's how we get uh, um, all this data of you know, what our error is and, and, and things of that nature is by looking at the comparing the predicted values, which are the values underneath the serial number column headers and comparing that to the actual data, the actual being the reference uh, values. Um, and so going back up to the, our box here, looking at the results column, uh, you'll see the first uh, thing uh, is this, this acronym RMSE. And so RMSE is the root mean square error. And we use this metric because it's a really uh, commonly used and it's a, a really good uh, a metric to use to investigate or to look at um, uh, the typical standard deviation from uh, uh, the actual true value um, that a prediction, a predicted value would have. Uh, so it's kind of like a take on error, um, but it's specifically uh, uh, used a lot in uh, uh, looking at model prediction uh, and model, uh, the robustness of model predictions. So uh, calculating the root mean square error involves um, um, uh, not much more math than taking an average error of something. Basically what you're doing is you're looking at the difference between the predicted value and the actual value. You square that, you divide it by the number of, of uh, values. So the number of, of samples. Um, and then from there you take the square root of that and that gives you your RMSE. And so a, uh, this is uh, uh, typically a lower RMSE is, is it means that that is a, a really robust model. Um, that can be a little misleading because what is low, uh, you know, we don't, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of question is what you, what it sh low should look like. Um, but an RMSE of 0.07 kind of indicates that um, that is the 0.07% dry matter is the average uh, deviation uh, based on the model's predictive ability. Uh, so uh, that, that uh, was a, a, a really good number to see. And then I already explained to you how the scan, the with scans with air, the fruit with air, less than five percent. But uh, those are divided into two different categories because one is on a single scan, a scan by scan basis. That's the scans with air, and then the other one is uh, uh, fruit with air, which is groupings of four scans per fruit. So it's looking at the averaging those groupings of four fruit, uh, and then looking at the error. Uh, based on the whole fruit uh, itself. And so those numbers are there. Um, and then uh, the last is looking at average error per one fruit. Uh, so this is again, per four scans uh, of a single fruit, the average relative error was 0.14%. And then the average uh, absolute error 
was 0.04 dry matter units or you know dry matter percentages. Um, and then we also just looked at the average air per lot of five fruit. So taking uh, uh, five fruit times four scans, that's 20 total scans. So increasing the scans from four scans to looking at 20 scans, our error went down, our relative error went down by 0.08%. And then our uh, error, uh, our absolute error, the dry matter units uh, went down by uh, 50%. So it's put now 0.02 as opposed to 0.04. Um, and keep that in the back of your mind because that's gonna come into play later on when we're talking about sources of variance and how to mitigate uh, variance within your instrument. So um, just know that when we are looking at the error uh, based on four scans uh, versus based on 20 scans, those metrics, uh, uh, the 20 scan metrics were um, uh, essentially half of what the five scan or four scan metric was. So that's enough statistical talk, I think, for, uh, for you guys for now. I don't think you were looking for a, uh, a, a lecture on, stat on introductory statistics today. So let's start talking about the instrument itself, uh, talk about the variance, uh, all the different sources of variation, uh, factors that affect uh, the measurement variance. And, um, and then also I want to talk about how the offset uh, or the, what we call on the instrument the prediction correction intercept um, is one of your most powerful tools to mitigate uh, a lot of variability. So there are three sources of variance uh, really uh, within our instrument. We can kind of, uh, you know, we can funnel all of these different variations into kind of three sources. Um, one of them and uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, 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 confounding variables is variation within the avocado itself. Avocado physiology uh, uh, creates a lot of variability within the fruit itself. Uh, and so things like measuring at the dorsal side versus the ventral, measuring the neck versus the body, uh, measuring the out outermost flesh versus the innermost flesh, um, all of those things uh, influence the, the results of, of looking at dry matter. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, the next one is variation due to the analytical procedure. So we already talked about this one uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, you know, each technique uh, you know, will provide a different uh, a, a reference or a true value. And so um, it's really hard to determine which one is the actual correct, uh, you know, which one is the truest of all of them. Um, but the, the key is to make sure that you are, uh, you know, uh, doing things consistently uh, and also using uh, instrumentation that is actually appropriate for the job. So, um, you know, for oven drying, making sure that you're using, uh, you know, uh, an oven that, that can hold a stable temperature and isn't going to fluctuate by, you know, 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so things of that nature and, and consistent technique also being technique on the analyst's part. You know, if you're going to let something cool before you weigh it after it just got done drying, you should be using a desiccator so that you aren't uh, introducing new moisture uh, into the fruit as it cools, uh, things of that nature. And then the third variation uh, is, is variation due to the instrument. And this is where we'll get really in depth with it today. And that's where the case study will kind of come into. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's a couple different uh, sources of variation. Um, from the instrument itself, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, variation from, you know, the actual hardware, the electronics and the optics, and then variation from the model, um, and then variation uh, from technique of using the instrument as well. So I said we would talk about more about uh, uh, um, uh, technique, or not technique, sorry, about uh, uh, fruit physiology and why that's uh, a, a, a source of variance uh, within uh, using the 751. Um, and so there's lots of studies out there uh, that, uh, uh, that have investigated the distribution of dry matter within avocado uh, fruit. Um, and now I'm focusing on avocado. I know there's a lot of you that are attending that might not be avocado growers or even care about avocado. Um, a, a lot of other fruit have this issue as well. 
Um, but uh, I think that uh, as far as uh, 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 providing uh, you know, sources of variation, Avocado does a pretty good job of uh, throwing in confounding variables as often as it can, uh, just simply due to the nature of the fruit itself. So we, uh, we're kind of focusing on the avocado right now. And, um, and so you can see there's, there's multiple studies out there that showed uh, that while the varying distributions uh, of dry matter within the fruit itself, based on its position, uh, you know, uh, between the neck or, or the, the bottom of the fruit, uh, the dorsal versus the ventral side, and then how close you get to the seed, uh, you know, the thickness, uh, you know, the closer you get to the seed, um, uh, the, the less dry matter there seems to be, the farther are, are out you are, there is more dry, higher dry matter concentration. And so, um, you know, with this much variation within a single fruit, it's really hard to get a full fruit idea of what the entire average of the fruit flesh dry matter is. Um, unless you use a sampling, a proper sampling technique. Um, and that applies not just to drying it in an oven, drying it in a dehydrator, but it also applies to our F751 avocado quality meter because uh, it's not a, our unit is not a single scan device. It's when it takes a scan, it's taking a, a, essentially what you can imagine as kind of a core sampling of that fruit. And so that would be like saying, uh, if you were doing a destructive sampling, if you took a single core from uh, you know, a site on the avocado and you said, this small core represents the entirety of the average dry matter of the flesh within this avocado. That's just simply not true. And so the same goes for scanning things with the F751. If you are really interested in the entirety, uh, the, the whole picture, the, you want the best idea of the true dry matter value within that avocado, you need to take, you need to take multiple, multiple sampling sites or with the 751, it's multiple scans. Uh, you need to take scans in multiple locations. Um, however, if, uh, if, the, if, if it's really more important for you, if you're dealing more in high volumes of fruit, um, then the best practice would be uh, to, to the best of your ability to find a location on the fruit that's going to give you uh, the most uh, representative uh, uh, value for the entirety of the fruit. And uh, from the research, it, it appears that for the most part, uh, you would want to scan at the equator of the fruit on the dorsal side. Um, and, and ideally, you would do it both at the dorsal and the ventral. You know, two scans doesn't take that much longer than uh, one scan. It's, it's still just a matter of seconds. Uh, and so you would get it, uh, the equator seems to be a good place to scan. Now, uh, a little bit of a wrench in that. Uh, uh, thanks to Dr. Asuna, uh, who I showed you his data earlier about the method comparison. Um, he's also looking at, at the, you know, the variation uh, when you look at uh, different sizes of avocado. Um, and so uh, it, it actually turns out that um, there, is, there can potentially be interference from the seed. Uh, if, uh, if you're using an avocado, um, that has too thin of flesh, uh, uh, then it, you are likely going to encounter uh, some sort of interference due to the nature of NIR technology. Uh, our, our instrument penetrates far enough into the flesh that uh, if, if your if you're, uh, thickness of flesh between the seed and the equator is not uh, thick enough, then you're going to get some interferences and that's a new source of variability. So, um, he will be uh, uh, likely uh, publishing data later on in, uh, uh, this year, I think, um, in order to uh, kind of look at what the best practice might be um, for avocados of varying sizes. And in, in the case where the seed is too large uh, and interfering with the scans, measuring at the neck actually turned out to be, uh, to be uh, a better practice. So just keep that in mind. Just keep in mind all the factors I can play in. Once you understand the technology itself and you understand what it does, it is a, it is a small aperture on an instrument that, that shoots light up into a, into a fruit. 
it doesn't then take an entire image. It just takes, as you can imagine, just like a core sampling essentially of that location and give you a prediction for the dry matter of that location. Now, if it's trying to penetrate and it hits something like a solid seed or some other kind of solid object, that is going to cause some interference in, uh, in the reading. Um, and so uh, uh, with other commodities that have say lots and lots of smaller seeds, so kiwi fruit, for example, um, uh, a lot of that is actually mitigated uh, just by building the model uh, 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 correctly. And so if you're uh, incorporating um, you know, uh, those kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, fruit that have high, you know, seed count in your model, um, then it'll, uh, the instrument will know, the model will know uh, that, uh, it, how to predict uh, just based on that. Um, and so just keep that in mind, uh, the fruit physiology plays a really big role in, in, in how uh, the instrument works. Um, and so, uh, you know, typically we do recommend if you, if you are limited to one or two scans of the fruit, scan at the equator. Um, however, you know, keep in mind this whole new kind of uh, emerging um, uh, idea of the seed being a possible cause of interference. So uh, I already, I just kind of talked about, you know, uh, numbers of scans there. And so this is a good transition um, to look at uh, uh, these three different kind of uh, use cases that uh, will help you get an idea of what we mean by taking the appropriate number of scans. Um, and so there's really, uh, there's a few different uh, options here. Um, and so if you're looking at a single fruit, if you're trying to judge a single fruit, say you're a breeder and you really have a limited number of fruit to work with, and you need to know a single fruit's dry matter and you need to know it as accurately as possible. Well, in that case, it makes a lot of sense uh, to take uh, four or eight or even more scans, as many scans as you uh, can to kind of get a whole picture idea of the fruit because you wanna know what the average is across that entire fruit. Um, uh, but if you're a grower, uh, and you're looking to look at a, a, a track harvest maturity in your plot, um, then uh, then you can simply uh, you know take uh, you know two scans of 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 a few fruit from uh, you know um, multiple areas uh, uh, within uh, your plot, and 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 so that would give you a good idea of the average um, across your plot. Um, really, it comes down to uh, you know, um, you know, how big is your plot, uh, you know, and, and it's up to you to decide what the actual sampling pattern should look like. Typically, um, sampling um, uh, fruit that is uh, both uh, uh, inside the canopy as well as uh, all the fruit that are kind of uh, more edging towards the outside um, will give you a good indication of the average dry matter uh, for that plot. Um, and then there's uh, another uh, uh, use case, which is even higher volume, looking at packaging, uh, pa you know, packagers, uh, people that are uh, storage facilities, distributors, um, even like importers and exporters. Um, here you're going to be getting, you know, truckloads and crates and upon crates of, of, of avocado. And um, in order to assess the average dry matter of a group of those, um, you'll need uh, uh, oftentimes we recommend, uh, you know, out sampling at least 30 fruit um, because with 30 fruit, uh, you can tolerate having one fruit being out of compliance. But if you, if you get two fruit that are out of compliance from your specs, uh, then the fruit would fail. Uh, then the, the whole batch would fail. So it gives you uh, a little bit of that wiggle room. But taking, uh, you know, at, at least, uh, you know, uh, two measurements per fruit um, is always the best idea um, and ideally taking more uh, if you really want the most accurate picture for uh, for the fruit. And I believe, uh, Eric, do we have another poll question coming up here? I wonder if he's still on. Oh, there we go. Uh, so yeah, so here's just a question for you since we're talking about, you know, these different use cases. 
Um, the question is how many fruit do you typically measure over the course of a season? So you should see the poll on your screen. Um, if you would uh, uh, like to answer, uh, I encourage you to do so. Um, just kind of helps us get an idea for, uh, you know, who you guys are and, and, and what's, you know, what is important to you and what might be the better strategy. Um, and so uh, really the kind of take home message for, for talking about these different use cases, as you can see, um, all of them kind of equal out to a very similar number of measurements, despite the fact that you're either looking at, you know, four fruit and that's all you have to work with, or if you're looking at 4,000 fruit, uh, uh, really it comes down to you want, if you want that accurate number, uh, you're gonna have a pretty similar number of scans across the board and it's not going to be one. Uh, you're gonna wanna take multiple scans, multiple sampling sites uh, to get that most accurate uh, value. Uh, so, uh, uh, there's other applications out there uh, for this, um, I, I know, and uh, everyone's uh, specific application is going to be a lot different. Um, if you uh, are someone that is interested or is already a user and you have a really unique um, kind of situation, uh, I highly encourage you to email uh, either myself or Eric and we um, would love to hear about what you do. Um, so here are the results for how many fruit do you typically measure over the course of a season. Uh, and so it looks like the most popular answer being about 21 to 100 uh, fruit. And then um, uh, coming up uh, pretty close is, is the, the larger uh, uh, facilities that are doing 1,000 plus um, um, uh, measurements over the course of a season. So um, pretty interesting, actually. Uh, you guys seem uh, overall pretty fairly evenly distributed. Uh, even if, when we talked about the methodologies, and now um, nobody coming in, a, nobody coming in with a super commanding uh, lead. So it's nice to see that we have a very diverse audience in here. Um, very cool. Uh, so yeah, the people that uh, um, uh, are doing the you know 21 to 100 measurements per season, um, uh, for the most part, if you have that few fruit to scan, it is uh, imperative to do multiple scans per fruit. Uh, so that you can ensure that you're getting the most accurate results you can get. So I told you I'd talk about, uh, lastly, the instrument variation um, and, and the different sources of that. Uh, um, and so let me preface this by saying that um, uh, there is uh, going to be variation um, in prediction value uh, um, based on uh, uh, a single location uh, with a, a multiple scan. So if you have one device, you put a fruit on it, you click the button, you wait a little bit, you click the button again without moving the fruit, there is going to be some var uh, variance in the prediction value. Um, and then also you will get prediction value variance if you have two instruments lined up, the same fruit, you scan it on the first instrument and, the same, and then in the same spot you scan it on the second instrument, those two instruments are going to have variation between them. Uh, and so there's a lot of reasons why. And our, in, our engineers, when designing this, uh, we've taken a lot of steps to uh, make sure that, um, that we are as consistent as possible on the hardware side of things. So compensating for external light leakage, um, measuring internal, uh, internal electrical noise and monitoring that, uh, and then compensating for uh, temperature changes within the instrument and things of that nature. Uh, so the hardware itself, we really work to make sure that, that it is providing as minimal variation, variance as possible um, because, uh, because there are so many other external factors that uh, can contribute. It's just imperative that, our, that we uh, create the instrument to not uh, increase the variance in any way due to the hardware or, or anything like that. Um, so let's talk about the variation between the instruments first. Uh, when I was talking about the example, when you're looking at two instruments, the same fruit in the same spot, and the reason they don't read, they re might read differently. Um, and so our current practice, uh, and this actually also goes back to um, our, our validation data a little bit too, is that uh, we calibrate each new production batch using local fruit from uh, our local markets. 
And so this, we have taken this approach uh, initially because um, we wanted to actually make sure that, that our models and our instruments are calibrated to actual fruit. Uh, and, and we thought that that would be best. And so we, uh, you know, each production batch gets a new set of fruit from a different, you know, potentially from a different region, potentially from a different season, you know, one that's been in storage for a long time versus one that isn't. This one happens to be more ripe than the other one. So there's a lot, as you can see, there actually is quite a bit of variation between the batches of instruments. And so we've come to realize now that uh, uh, despite the fact that we, you know, we initially thought that testing on, on fruit itself would, would uh, be better for, uh, you know, uh, making sure that the model is predicting well, uh, we actually are uh, shifting our focus to uh, developing a new process to eliminate uh, that batch to batch variation and to ensure that all instruments going forward um, uh, regardless of when they were produced, when they were manufactured in our facility, uh, will read um, um, as uh, similarly as possible as the next, as a device from any other time in the production. Uh, and so that hopefully will be a, a, a good um, method that will um, help eliminate or at least uh, severely, uh, you know, decrease uh, that variation between instruments that you see. And actually, uh, when I go into the case study, you'll see an example of how that variation between instruments plays out. Um, and then uh, uh, the variation within a single instrument. Uh, so uh, within, so when you have a single device and you scan the same spot of the same fruit twice in a row and you get different values and you're wondering what's up with that, um, uh, with each measurement, uh, uh, the built-in calibration model will interpret the attenuation of various wavelengths of light that have interacted with the fruit flesh. So there's a lot of things going on. And uh, to be able to get the exact same spectra two times in a row from a fruit, from a fruit that's still physiologically, you know, technically changing, uh, and, and ripening at, you know, it might not be at a very rapid pace, but there is change happening, chemical change happening within that fruit, uh, then uh, uh, that's what causes this variation within a single instrument. Um, and so we'll talk about here in a second, but um, when you're seeing that, uh, uh, you know, across fruit as well, um, and you're seeing that difference between uh, what your typical uh, methodology is versus what the 751 is reading. Um, the offset uh, or prediction correction intercept is, is a tool that's utilized to correct the predicted value um, if external factors are creating a bias in the measurements. Um, and that's something I will go into more detail here in a second, don't you worry. Um, and the next uh, uh, variation uh, uh, we've already talked about here uh, is from your sampling technique and the sampling size. So I just want to reiterate, um, the 751 is not intended to be a single scan device. It's not something that will, you can just put up to a piece of fr any any fruit, click a button, and it'll tell you the complete average dry matter of the whole fruit because that's just not how the technology works. It's, it's taking a, a small sample uh, from within that fruit and looking at that and predicting what the dry matter is of that small core sampling. Um, and so uh, by taking multiple scans of multiple fruit, utilizing the average of those, the user gains more confidence in the predicted value. And so I explained that as well in that validation data so this is a callback to that validation data, the avocado validation data, where we are looking at the average error uh, that was less than, uh, uh, or the average, ab or sorry, ab average relative error and the average absolute error of one fruit versus five fruit. And we saw that when you're looking at the average error of five fruit, the error is decreased by more, or by 0.08, which was over half of, uh, of what the average error of um, one fruit was. And so in, in, in the terms of dry matter units, it went down from 
percent dry matter of av uh, average absolute error for one fruit to 0.02 percent if you increase that number to five fruit. So, uh, and remember, each fruit was four scans. So, uh, uh, so that's just uh, you know something to keep in mind is that if increased accuracy is what you want, the most powerful tool is uh, uh, to gain confidence in your predicted values is to take more scans in more locations on multiple fruit um, and, and that will give you the better idea of the entire fruits uh, dry matter. So let's jump into this case study. I was talking a lot about prediction correction intercept or what we also refer to as offset. Uh, a lot during this uh, 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 webinar. And so now I think is a good time to actually show you um, uh, what that tool is and how it works. Um, and so this is a good example. This is real data. Names have been eliminated uh, in order to protect privacy. Um, uh, so this is uh, data uh, that was acquired. Um, in this case study, it was uh, three instruments that are from three uh, separate regions of a country. Uh, and uh, they were all compared against each other in the same laboratory uh, and also compared against a reference method. So this is looking at not only uh, accuracy compared to a reference method, but it's also looking at uh, the variance between instruments. Um, and so uh, what this will demonstrate is how a simple offset correction uh, can reduce both of those sources of variability. And so looking at these two graphs, um, uh, uh, let me just kind of lay them out here for you. The, uh, the x-axis here is the reference method uh, uh, dry matter. The y-axis is the F751 dry matter. And so what we're looking at is for any given single data point, uh, there is both a uh, dry matter value form from the reference method as well as from the 751. So it's comparing how those two match up. And ideally, there you'll see there's a curve, there's a line built into both of these graphs. And that's looking at the ideal relationship because if everything was ideal, then every scan of the 751 would predict the exact same value as the control or reference method. And that would result in them aligning in this straight line. Uh, However, that's not how uh, 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 it works in real life because of all the different sources of variance that we've talked about today. Um, and so what you see here is uh, uh, on the top graph is a cluster of, of measurements uh, um, that are uh, 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 in groupings of, of uh, by color. They're in groupings of one that is reading really well and, and on that ideal relationship line one that's gathered uh, kind of lower than the, uh, and it's a little bit below the line, but it looks like it's trending in the same direction. Uh, and then we have another uh, data set that's much lower than that, uh, and but also still trending in a similar direction as the ideal relationship. Now, if you apply an, the right offset correction for each of these uh, data sets, for each of these instruments, uh, if you look at the lower graph, this is what happens. You shift all of that data essentially upwards uh, by a specified number of units. Uh, and that, that number is, as I'll show you in a little bit, is based on the difference, uh, the average difference between your uh, control and your 751 measurements. Um, and so with this data shifted up, you now see all the data is now centered along the ideal relationship curve. Um, and the data all looks much better. So another way to visualize this uh, is to look at uh, this uh, type of graph. So some people prefer to look at uh, uh, this kind of graph when visualizing offsets versus what I just showed you. Um, this is a simple line graph. The x-axis is the number of fruit, while the y-axis is the dry matter percentage value. Um, and so the black line is the reference method. Um, the solid lines are uh, just the uh, instrument data by itself. The dashed or dotted lines are the uh, offset corrected 
uh, data sets for both of the uh, corresponding instruments. And so you can see, just like in the last graph, uh, instrument three, the green line, was already trending pretty well with the reference method, um, but instrument one was trending slightly lower, and instrument two trending uh, 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 notably a lot lower. Um, and then once you do the correction, once you, uh, once you input the correct offset, those, that data now all goes back to being centered just around the reference method and predicting much more accurately. And now looking at uh, the raw data itself, uh, this is a good example at uh, um, uh, both showing you how we come up with the offset, but also showing you the power of, of increasing your number of scans or increasing the number of data points you have. Um, and so you see this column titled deviation from control. That's just looking at the difference between what the instrument uh, spat out as a predicted measurement versus the reference method. And so uh, if you look at the, the first uh, column of deviation from control, looking at instrument one, so the, uh, the first reading for instrument one for fruit number one, it was reading 1.3% dry matter lower than the reference method. And then you go down the column, you see for each of these fruit, there's a deviation from the control. When you average that deviation, uh, you actually get a good idea of how much, uh, how much of an offset you need to input into your device. So that value, that negative 3.1, once that negative 3.1 is put into the device itself, uh, the, the model will then understand that all data that it spits out needs to be increased by 3.1% dry matter because there is an inherent bias in, in the model's predictive ability. And so once it knows to do that, you can, you can get your new predicted set of values and you can see that even though we've now adjusted for the offset, you'll notice on a single fruit basis, there is still a deviation from the reference method with every measurement. Uh, in, and in some cases you might see an increase, you might see a decrease in that, in that deviation. Um, uh, uh, in general, most values will decrease uh, uh, from, uh, from the original deviation without the offset. Now, when you're looking at on an individual fruit basis, you're like, wow, a lot, some of these deviate, you know, quite a bit or, or, you know, more than I'm comfortable with. Yes. So that's the same reason why this is not a single scan device, because when you look at these individual fruit on an individual fruit basis, there is always deviation. However, if you look at the average row at the bottom and you look at the average across all 10 of those fruit, the average of the reference method is 21.4% dry matter. The average of those 10 fruit for each of these instruments that were offset corrected is also 21.4% dry matter which means that there's that the more scans you take, the more fruit you incorporate, the higher your sample size, the more accurate this device is gonna be for you. Sure, on an individual basis, you are seeing deviation. However, at the end of the day, when you go to average all of these, your offset, or your, not sorry, not your offset, your error, your error percent just is extremely, extremely low. And in this case, it was zero. So that's just the show, to show you the power um, of, of using the multiple, sc multiple scans, multiple fruit, um, in order to get uh, the most accurate idea for your, for your study or for your application. Um, and so that's all, I wanted to, that's all I wanted to show you guys today. Um, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot uh, of statistics we could dive into. There's a lot, uh, you know, to talk about when it comes to model building and things of that nature. But this is just kind of to show you guys the best practices, uh, you know, tools that you can incorporate yourselves into your practice in order to help increase the accuracy uh, for your use. Um, and so uh, just in summary, uh, we know we talked about the dry matter methods. Um, there's really no way to determine which one is is the most true of all, uh, but each method has its own inherent variability. And we've seen that both in anecdotal and real life data that um, every method uh, you know, is gonna um, 
uh, predict uh, slightly differently from one another. And <clears throat> the most important thing is to look for a method that can be as consistent as possible. Uh, we then talked about the validation data. Uh, uh, and I talked about um, uh, all the key statistics, uh, how RMSE uh, is used. Uh, we use that to look at the robustness of the model, to look at the typical standard deviation that a predicted measurement would have. Uh, uh, and so um, also talked about uh, uh, sources of variance. Uh, so looking at uh, the variability comes from the one of the three sources, right? The physiology of the fruit, um, the instrument itself, uh, and then the refer reference method that is being used uh, to build and validate the model. Um, uh, and, and lastly, uh, and one, one of the more important uh, messages here to take home is that um, uh, while we have taken as lots of measures to minimize the variability from the instrument um, <clears throat> from a hardware perspective, um, there are just variables that we simply can't control. Um, and uh, in order to overcome a lot of this variability, all it takes is, is for the user to utilize the offset uh, correction, uh, also known as the prediction correction intercept. Um, and it's really extremely powerful tool to help reduce the variability between instruments, variability within one instrument. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think, Eric, do we have another poll question here before we get into the end of things? Yeah, so we do have another poll question. Um, Let's go ahead and jump into that. So this is a, a question that we want to know just to kind of get to know you guys better. Um, uh, it's just to kind of get an understanding of, of, of our audience and we just want to know um, uh, which part of the supply chain do you guys work in. Um, so if you feel comfortable answering, uh, we would really appreciate your feedback uh, to get to know, you know, who we're talking to and um, <clears throat> who, uh, you know, who is interested uh, uh, in, in learning more about, about the 751. Um, so yeah, so I actually, I, um, I'll go ahead and advance the next slide while we wait, but uh, I really appreciate you guys all, uh, uh, you know, taking the time out to be here. Uh, we'll be at the Q&A here in a little bit. Um, once this poll is over, I'll just have a little bit more to talk about and then we'll uh, jump right into some questions and answers. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I hope everyone's staying safe and, and during this time, uh, and uh, uh, I really appreciate you guys being out here. So uh, looks like the results are in. Um, again, fairly even distribution uh, across people that are growers, packers, importers, exporters, um, uh, and we have a few people bre breeders. We have some retail folk here. And we have a whole heck of a lot of people that um, are, are other. And uh, uh, I think we probably should have put something like research or something like that in this poll, because I have a feeling that some of you might be in that category as well. But um, thank you for answering that poll. Uh, before we end here, I just want to talk to you quick about a couple of our offerings. Uh, so we do have uh, the, the F751 Kiwi qual quality meter is now for sale. Um, we released that back in February, um, and it works for both dry matter and bricks measurements in gold and Hayward kiwi fruit. Uh, and then we also are really excited about our upcoming release. Um, uh, it's to be announced, but uh, uh, we are really excited about it. It's our new CI710 Spectrum U leaf spectrometer. And so uh, it is uh, uh, another spectrometer offering we have. Um, that's more focused towards plant research, has lots of built-in indices for, uh, you know, color compounds, carotenoids, chlorophyll, anthocyanins, um, things like uh, um, uh, the uh, NDVI uh, index are in there. Um, and then also uh, the 710 will have the ability to uh, create PLS models similarly to our F750 produce quality meter. So if you've always wanted to build a model to measure water and spinach leaves or uh, 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 something like that, then this instrument will be a perfect fit for you. So uh, kind of and to wrap up here, uh, if you guys want to get connected with us, if you want to keep up with what we're doing, uh, the best way is to visit our website, 
Um, but also you can always follow us on social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, or on LinkedIn. Um, you uh, can email us if you have uh, sales questions. Uh, you can always uh, give us a call as well. Um, and uh, once this uh, uh, whole quarantine and is over and, and things have returned to normal, if you happen to be in the area, uh, you can always stop by our headquarters in Camas, Washington. Um, we're right outside of Portland, Oregon, uh, and we always love to have uh, visitors, not during this time. Uh, we uh, Please do not come visit us if you are thinking about it during this time. But uh, once, once uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, kind of uh, tapered off, uh, maybe then um, uh, would be a good time. If you happen to be in the area, we, we do love visitors. Uh, and we'd love to take you on our facility. So um, that's it for the presentation. We'll jump into the question and answer session here. Um, if you do want to quote, uh, go ahead uh, and uh, uh, Eric will be posting a link in the chat, uh, this uh, tiny URL, Accurate Dry Matter, um, that will uh, take you directly to uh, our quote system. Um, if you uh, would like a consultation, so um, before we jump into these question and answers, if you have something that's a very specific to your situation, it requires more detail than I could possibly give you over a quick answer via webinar. Um, if you have a question about how you can apply your technology uh, to whatever operation you have, um, please go ahead and schedule a consultation. We're, Eric and I are both more than happy to talk to you, help you figure out you know, how you can utilize our instrument or help you go through your data, figure out you know, what's going on if, if you're having any sort of difficulties. So um, if it's something uh, very specific to your uh, operation or specific to your data kind of question, uh, it's better off if you e email us directly um, or set up a, a consultation. Um, and in either way, we'll, both, we'll get back to you um, uh, with that. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and open the question and answer box um, so the question is, the first question is, uh, regarding, uh, the, and actually, you know what, I might end up in this having to kind of go back to some slides to reference them, but, um, the question is, hi, explain why absolute error is much lower than the error in each row. Uh, so abs the absolute error is, uh, basically a, the percentage relative error uh, uh, multiplied by the, let me pull up the slide here. I wonder if we're talking about, let's, let's do this one. Yes. Okay. So uh, if we're looking at this first column here, uh, our percent error is a relative error. So that's saying that 18.59 uh, is 5% off from 17.65. Um, but if you look at just this, number 18.59 minus this number, it gives us the absolute error, which is 0.95% dry matter. So it's, I think the confusion might be coming from the fact that dry matter happens to also be in a percentage value. We're talking about percentage of errors and then we're talking about dry matter percent. Um, so think of the dry matter percent as a dry matter unit. Uh, and, and then the percent error is the relative error. So uh, even though, um, you know, 18.59 uh, uh, is 5% error wise, it's 5% off from 17.65. If you look at it in strictly terms of dry matter units, 18.59 minus 17.65 is gonna give you a, a 0.95 um, difference. Uh, okay. And Before, uh, I also wanted to mention that the webinar will be, is recorded and if you're in attendance, you'll receive an email uh, to the link to the YouTube page, which will have the webinar. Awesome. And Galen will also um, be posting the presentation PowerPoint slides as well. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. It, uh, if you, if you, you know, if, if this, if it was at too fast of a pace for you, or if it was uh, something you want to show your colleagues or something like that, then if you have registered, yes, you will be receiving recordings. You'll be able to see uh, the, the actual just PowerPoint itself, all of that. So, 
Um, so the next question is, uh, uh, what is the d relationship between sugar content and dry matter of a produce? Does sugar content of a produce affect the dry matter using all methodologies? Thank you. Okay, so this is a, a two-parter question. The first part, um, the relationship between sugar and dry matter. Um, so dry matter, uh, even though it's technically, um, you know, uh, defined as anything that isn't water, right, within the fruit, uh, 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 for the most part, people look at dry matter as being correlated to the starch content of, of a fruit. And so as a fruit matures, it gains more starch content. Um, and then as it ripens, uh, it actually will uh, start converting some of that starch into sugar. Uh, and so over time, uh, after, after ripening, uh, you'll, have a, you'll have this kind of change in balance from dry matter uh, from starch uh, turning into sugar. Um, where that plays into uh, how it affects uh, the dry, how does sugar content affect the dry matter using these dry matter methodologies? Um, uh, for the most part, what we've found uh, in, in all of our studies is that um, the higher the sugar content of a fruit, uh, the more difficult it is to use any sort of uh, microwave method or kind of faster paced uh, uh, or higher temperature methods because the sugar will start to burn uh, more easily. The higher the sugar content, the easier or the more prone a fruit is to, or a piece of produce is to being burned. Um, and uh, burning something obviously is a, a, a change in chemical composition and it actually does uh, influence, uh, especially when you're doing something, a test that is a gravimetric test, which all of these tests are, except for the, uh, all these methodologies are gravimetric besides uh, the NIR method. Um, uh, when you're doing something gravimetrically, losing weight uh, that isn't uh, uh, weight being lost by water loss um, will uh, actually kind of uh, artificially uh, uh, inflate or uh, technically deflate your, your dry matter value. Um, uh, and so burning uh, overall uh, is something that happens across all methodologies if you do it wrong. Uh, besides also, I suppose, freeze drying, which is not very commonly used technology for, for, for dry matter uh, tests, but can be used. Um, but for ovens, if you have too high of a temperature in your oven or on your dehydrator, um, and if you try to use a microwave, uh, then you will likely burn your uh, uh, fruit and it will give you a uh, incorrect um, or inaccurate uh, value for dry matter. So that is uh, the question, that question. And then the next question is, um, if you scan a fruit again in your validation example, do you move the fruit off the F751 and place it back? And are you measuring on the same spot for the four measurements per fruit? Oh, okay, so this is probably referencing the avocado talking about four measurements. Let me go to that slide. Um, okay, so uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, do two scans in the same spot. So um, if you were, if you, if that was something that interested you and you wanted to scan the same spot in the fruit, there's multiple options there. So um, uh, the, uh, the best practices would either be uh, a, to mark the precise location on the fruit where you scanned, and then you can remove it and then put the fruit back on, uh, or you wait an appropriate amount of time before taking the second scan. Because what you're gonna do, if you just keep continuously taking scans back, back to back to back, you, that's a really powerful lamp, and you're actually altering the temperature of the fruit itself, which is another factor that plays into how the model predicts. And so you don't want to be taking uh, uh, multiple scans in a row like that. Um, so if you are going to leave it on in the same spot and choose not to mark the fruit, then leave it on, but allow it time to kind of stay at room temperature so you aren't artificially heating the fruit. Um, as far as are you measuring, are we, were we measuring on the same spot uh, for the four measurements per fruit? No. So we actually, how we do it is, Along the equator, we take four equidistant uh, measurements. So um, we would take one on the dorsal side, one on the lateral side, and then one each on the other two sides. 
Uh, and so we have four scan sites around the equator of the fruit, uh, four unique scan sites. Uh, and that also answers the next question, which is about the same question about the four scans. So um, yes, it was different, different, four different spots equidistant along the equator of the fruit. Um, the next question is, so is the F751 accurate to around 0.14%? Um, so uh, the average error per four scans, so four scans to one fruit, the average relative error was 0.14%. Uh, and, and that is with our validation data. Uh, so this is fruit that was acquired from local markets, uh, fruit that was already uh, fully mature. Um, and so for that uh, purpose, yes, the, the error was 0.14%. Can we make a blanket statement and say that it's always going to be accurate at point to point one four percent? No, we cannot because uh, there are so many other variables that are going to come into play. Um, uh, but in the case of this of this data set, uh, that's the accuracy we saw, and and it is you know uh, a good general predictor of saying in you know in general you will see accuracy that's that's pretty similar to that. Uh, the next question is, uh, can this 751 be used for other fruits, i.e. can we develop our own calibration? Um, so actually, uh, uh, that's what we have the F750 for. The 750 is a, a, a research uh, a version of the 751 in which you can build calibrations for all, any sort of commodity you wish. And there, uh, we actually have uh, some webinars on, we have a webinar online, I believe, about the 750 um, and lots of more information. If you need more information on that, you can um, uh, feel free to email us and I can provide you more. But the 751 is, is strictly to be used with just uh, the commodity that uh, we uh, name it, essentially. So whatever commodity it's, it's named for, that's the model that's on there and that's all that it is to be used for. Um, the next question is, can I explain the meaning of the RMSE again? Um, so RMSE is the root mean square error. Uh, the root mean square error is a, a, a calculation that is used uh, in, uh, when looking at predictive ability of models. Uh, it's, it's basically what it's looking at is the uh, typical standard deviation that a measurement will have uh, and so uh, what, what I, when I say that, what, what I mean is uh, any, if you were to take any sort of typical scan, what would uh, uh, the difference between that scan and uh, the, if you were to test it, you know, by the reference method, what would that uh, look like? And so since our reference method was the dehydrator, um, if we uh, were to actually go and um, you know, run, take a scan and then run the reference method by dehydrator, we would expect uh, the standard deviation to be uh, between that uh, scan and the reference method to be about 0.07. Um, something I just remembered that I failed to uh, kind of talk about is that uh, um, since these validation data, this is all reference method specific, right? And there's all these different reference methods. Um, the nice thing about the offset correction is that it's versatile and you can use it uh, uh, against any reference method uh, that you wish. And so whatever is the typical operation at your facility, whether you're using an oven or a microwave, if you want the device to perform to the specifications of that or you know, to the accuracy of the microwave or the oven, all you have to do is, is utilize that as your reference method during, a, this, uh, uh, during these uh, offset calibration studies. And uh, when you do that, uh, that's basically telling the instrument, okay, since I'm saying the microwave is the reference method, I want, you to, I want the instrument to perform to the microwave standards. And so all you have to do is change the offset accordingly and it'll start reading very similar to the microwave method. Same can be said for the oven. If you decide instead that you want to use the oven, all you have to do is, is change your reference method and then uh, uh, it'll uh, 
in turn change your offset. And then once you change your offset again, it'll be reading to the it'll be reading uh, similarly to the oven method. So it's a really versatile tool. I just uh, sorry that that was just a thought I, I had that I was I was going to discuss, but I totally kind of forgot to say that during the webinar. Um, the next question is, what would you recommend for trying to scan and record the dry matter percent of a large number of fruits? So like for exporters, um, uh, it's kind of hard to say uh, an exact number. Uh, uh, so it depends on uh, a lot of things on, on uh, this, your system for, uh, you know, receiving lots um, or for, or for uh, shipping out lots. Uh, it depends on uh, the number of fruit that you are shipping out per lot or the number of fruit that uh, you're shipping out in total. Um, what I really recommend is uh, if you want to, uh, you know, get a little statistical with it, um, uh, I would actually look up a, a, a sample size calculator. So there's these statistical tools on the internet uh, that are called sample size calculators. And uh, essentially all you have to do is plug in a few things like how confident do you wanna be? So uh, if you wanna be 95% confident, uh, then you would put 95% in. You say how big is your population size? So how many fruit uh, uh, total are there? And then, you, then it'll spit out for you um, a, a appropriate sample size that would get you to that kind of confidence level um, uh, uh, within, uh, uh, and so then you can kind of go off of that. Um, I think that, uh, I don't think there is a good general kind of rule or number for uh, a large number of fruits. Um, I think that it really needs to be taken on a case by case basis. Um, but I'd be more than happy to talk to you more about it. Uh, if you do want to email uh, either myself or Eric, we can, we can kind of figure it out together if you want, if you uh, would like to uh, kind of have an idea. Uh, the next question is, how thick must the peel be? What about other fruits like melon? Can you scan this kind of fruit? Um, so the, actually the thickness of the uh, exocarp or the skin or the peel, the rind, uh, it, is, it does play a pretty critical role in how the ability of the 751 to function. Um, uh, as I mentioned already before, the 751 is a single commodity meter, so only the 750 can be used uh, with multiple commodities or, or or commodities that aren't uh, already built into a 751. Uh, but the uh, thickness does play a factor. So uh, uh, for instance, uh, with avocado, the rind is thin enough that our, our lamp is able to penetrate through into the flesh. Uh, the same goes for uh, uh, thinner uh, uh, rind fruit like uh, honeydew, for example. Um, actually, it, it, uh, uh, even though that's a little bit thicker, our uh, instrument still is able to penetrate into the flesh, albeit not as deep into the flesh likely as, as uh, uh, you know, it doesn't go all the way to the core or anything like that. Um, it just, uh, but it is able to penetrate the flesh. Um, unfortunately, fruit that have really irregular or thick uh, uh, rinds, so things like pineapple and watermelon, uh, those are, uh, uh, it is not, has, we have not been able to be successful in getting a scan um, that is able to penetrate through those rinds and into the flesh of the fruit in a non-destructive way. The workaround for that is to um, actually peel away some of the, uh, uh, the rind itself so that you can actually get a direct measurement of the flesh. However, this renders the method from non-destructive to destructive. Um, albeit it still is a, a very rapid method of testing, um, uh, it still, uh, it does, uh, you know, can uh, be off-putting, I guess, to some people if they are looking for a non-destructive method. All right, the next question is, to your knowledge, have models been developed on avocado through the ripening process? Uh, and so that's a good question. Uh, uh, our models, um, uh, currently the avocado model uh, really only uh, predicts well uh, uh, up to the around 34% uh, dry matter range. We start to lose our accuracy uh, once you get above 34% dry matter. So the really ripe, really mature and ripe fruit um, tend to not do as well. Uh, um, 
Uh, and so, uh, but as long as your fruit, uh, you know, stay with underneath, under the 34% dry matter value, um, then uh, uh, our model will still predict fairly well. Uh, we are continuously working to update these models. Uh, and so we, we are constantly trying to increase the accuracy, increase the measurement range, all those things. Um, and, and, and so hopefully in the near future here, we will have a, a new uh, version uh, release uh, that will be able to more accurately measure up into the higher ranges into the 40s, 40% um, 40 dry matter range. Uh, oh wait, I think I skipped a question. <laughs> uh, so um, for reading, could it affect the soil or defects of the fruit? Oh, could it detect? Um, so the question is, can it detect uh, the soil or defects of the fruit? Um, so uh, if you are measuring uh, uh, a fruit that is, you know, covered in dirt or one that is covered in defects, um, uh, you are likely going to get uh, uh, changes to your readings. Uh, um, so we definitely always recommend, uh, you know, at least trying to wipe off any visible, uh, you know, dirt from the fruit uh, before you scan it. Um, and, and scanning directly on a defect is also not uh, highly recommended because those just introduce new variables that aren't really accounted for in the model. Um, so you want to avoid scanning the defects. If you can find spots on the fruit that aren't defective, um, uh, it's recommended that you scan there. This also uh, applies to mo any moisture as well. Since it is a spectrometer, uh, any moisture on the fruit will refract, uh, has a possibility of refracting the light that penetrates the fruit and giving you inaccurate results. Yep. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, I totally. Yep. Yeah. So uh, water as well. So uh, you really kind of want to make sure that uh, there's there's this minimal. You know, it's it goes back to the technique uh, thing. Is that when you uh, when you when you perform scans, you want to eliminate as many variables as possible when you are are actually performing the scans. Um, the next question is: You talk about two measurements per fruit mostly. Should this be on the opposite equatorial sides? So, uh, and that's where uh, the fruit physiology comes into play. Uh, uh, you know, it's going to be different for every fruit. Uh, so, uh, when you talk about two scans um, for kiwi fruit, yeah, two scans on the opposite equatorial sides uh, works really well um, because the kiwi fruit is a, a much smaller fruit. It's more translucent than uh, other fruits. The light penetrates really well. Um, you know, the rind's really thin. So uh, yeah, that works really well for kiwi fruit. With avocado, uh, you know, as I mentioned, sometimes uh, you know you uh, have a fruit where the the um, uh, the seed might be too large and actually could cause interference if you if you scan at the equatorial sides. Um, and uh, uh, in that case, you'd want to take scans, two scans at different sides of the neck or you'd want to do one at the neck and one at the base of the fruit. Um, and so it really, it really is dependent on uh, the nature of the fruit itself uh, when we do two measurements per fruit. Uh, but typically though, when we, if we're doing two scans on an avocado, um, that is what we would do. We would do, uh, if we know that we're not gonna get interference from the, if the fruit size is appropriate, uh, then we won't, uh, then we then we will scan uh, both the dorsal and ventral side at the equator, um, and use that as our uh, as our average for the fruit. Yes. All right. The next question is uh, for the instrument variation explained slide. How much of the variation that you see when you measure a fruit on the same spot? Sorry. Uh, how much variation that you see when you measure a fruit on the same spot on two instruments? do you think is due to the difference in instruments versus due to measuring on a slightly different spot? Um, I think that they uh, 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 both contribute. Uh, I don't know if I can put an actual like, kind of number uh, to that, um, but definitely I think that if you're measuring uh, a fruit on the same spot, it, uh, there are uh, um, uh, some easy ways to, to uh, mitigate the possibility of uh, accidentally scanning in a slightly different spot. Uh, so um, by tracing uh, around the scan head uh, uh, um, where exactly on the fruit where you're scanning, 
uh, making you know markings uh, to know you know making sure the fruits in the same orientation things like that can uh, you know uh, can help uh, make sure that you reduce that variance from measuring in a slightly different spot. However, um, it is inevitable that you won't put it on the exact exact same spot, um, and so that does contribute slightly to the variance. Um, I think that, um, however, if you do uh, your due diligence. Uh, and you are uh, being, uh, uh, you know, as accurate as possible about getting the fruit in the same spot, then more of that variation is likely due to the fact that we, um, uh, that those two instruments, uh, you know, uh, have different offsets in them because they were calibrated with different, a different type of, or, you know, different fruit from a different region, likely from a different, you know, at a different maturity stage, different ripeness stage. So, um, I think that that's more likely the more the uh, larger cause of variation if you're doing your best to make sure that the fruit is on the same spot um, uh, and you're marking your fruit correctly. So the next question is, is external light influence the main cause of variation of measurements performed with the same instrument? How can it be minimized? Uh, no. So actually uh, uh, we've, uh, um, um, uh, done uh, a lot on our end on the engineering end to compensate for external light influence. Um, and we actually have a, a built-in uh, reference shutter system uh, that we utilize to compensate for the external light uh, uh, influence. And so that actually uh, is not uh, a major source of variation at all um, uh, for measurements performed with the same instrument. Um, however, that being said, uh, uh, you know, you do want to make sure you do your best to cover the entirety of the lens uh, with the fruit uh, when you are taking scans. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, don't, you know, I wouldn't, uh, you know, have the fruit sticking only half on the lens and, and you taking scans of half air and half fruit. Um, that can influence the, that can influence the, the results, obviously, in a negative way. So um, just do your best to cover the lens. However, you know, if, especially with fruit like kiwi fruit, for example, it's not when you put it on the equator, it's it's flat, and so it's not going to sit and cover the entirety of the lens. You're going to have areas where we're like get in, but that's why we have our built-in shutter system, um, and uh, and that so that is not a major source of variance. Uh, the next question is, what is a simple offset correction? So. Um, I really hope that uh, uh, I got some of the point across um, uh, for the offset correction during the actual talk, uh, but the offset is just uh, basically uh, how we calculate it is the average difference uh, between the predicted values from the instrument and the reference method. So it's just, if you look at this table here, it's just uh, these values this value minus this value, which is negative 1.3. This for fruit number two, the instrument value um, uh, versus this uh, reference method value, it's negative 3.6. So um, uh, that's uh, uh, that's how we calculate our deviation. Or, and then once you take for all of your sample set, you take the average of all those those differences, and that's your offset correction. The next question is, is the correction for the calibration of each instrument? Um, so the, the, the offset correction can be, is, is what we use when we initially calibrate the instruments. Um, it's also what the user should use if they notice trends like the ones that we talked about earlier today. Um, it, each instrument has the ability to set an offset correction. Um, uh, and and it, all it does is, is it changes the mathematics of the, of the uh, model prediction so that it adds or subtracts uh, a certain value uh, based on your study, uh, you know, from uh, whatever it was initially going to predict. Um, with this next question is with this offset calculation, is it possible to have a lab reference versus field measurement of the same cultivar of fruit? Um, uh, I imagine you're saying, so uh, as in cultivar, as in like uh, uh, all Haas avocado. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, you, with the offset calculation, you can make it uh, as specific as you want. If you are only going to be looking at one cultivar of fruit, um, but the model incorporates, you know, 
four different varieties or something like that in the case of mango like six or, or eight different varieties then if you're looking at if you if you only are interested in one say you're only interested in kent uh mangoes then um uh it is possible to just actually run your offset offset study with just that cultivar of fruit and then once you have that offset it'll actually um, uh, be specifically tailored to that cultivar of fruit um, which uh, if you then go to try to measure a new cultivar, a different cultivar like Keats or Tommy Atkins, um, uh, then uh, we can, uh, you will likely see uh, that the offset doesn't work as well for just that one. So if you do a, 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 a calibration procedure that enco encompasses all of those fruit, all of the different cultivars, and then calculate your offset from that, It'll be a good device to use across all, you know, it'll be a good general device to use across all your different cultivars. However, if you are only interested in one cultivar, then it is, uh, it is absolutely in your best interest to go ahead and, and only do a, an offset calibration for that cultivar so that your instrument is, is specifically tailored to that cultivar and to your reference method. That's what's great about the offset uh, 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 calculation is that uh, the offset correction, uh, it, it, you can tailor it to specifically what you want. Um, uh, so if you, you want to, your, your instrument to read accurately for only Haas avocado for only the microwave method, you can make sure that your offset actually allows your instrument to, to read to that standard. So um, the next question is, uh, uh, could you clearly indicate which areas of the avocados should be measured if you make two or four measurements per fruit? Um, yeah, so we typically recommend the equator. Um, however, uh, so with Dr. Asuna's new research coming out, um, uh, we will be revising our guidelines based on, on what his findings are about a fruit size. So there will eventually, we will be releasing uh, 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 new guidelines based on fruit size. Um, uh, to determine where is the best place to scan, best places to scan. But for, uh, for right now, for the most part, um, uh, it's typically four locations equidistant from each other. So, uh, you know, four uh, different locations. If you think of your uh, equator as being a circle, so you get 90 degrees um, uh, each way that you have a scan along the equator. Uh, and that'll give you a good idea. Um, for two measurements, I would just do dorsal and ventral side, so 180 degrees between each measurement. Uh, the next question is, is it best to test the fruit on the tree when possible? Um, so uh, it, uh, it really depends on your application. If you're a grower and you want to track your harvest maturity, then I would say it is best to test the fruit on the tree. And actually, the best part about the instrument is that you can test the fruit on the tree. You don't have to pick it. You don't have to destroy it by any means. You just have to go up to the tree, go up to the fruit and take your scan. Uh, uh, but if you are, uh, uh, you know, a, an importer or an exporter or a retailer, um, then, uh, uh, then your application would be to test it, you know, when it comes into your facility and, and lots. Um, so it's really, uh, it all depends on your application, but um, uh, yeah, uh, if, it would be um, a shame to, uh, if you were a grower, to pick your fruit and then use the 751 because um, it was intended to be a non-destructive device. So we don't want to have to let any of your fruit go to waste. Um, the next question is from uh, 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 Dr. Asuna here. So uh, how important is the method for getting the dry matter reference value? Uh, so actually, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most critical points of, of model building and validation um, because you are saying that that is your control, like that is your reference method. And so if you are performing that wrong or, or, or you are doing something to invalidate those values, then, uh, uh, then, you, and then you go and decide to uh, tailor your instrument to read uh, similarly to those values, then you have now uh, caused the instrument to read inaccurately because you were performing the uh, uh, initial uh, test uh, inaccurately. So making sure that everything from uh, you know, your sampling technique 
to, uh, to the, the, the analyst technique uh, of actually performing the drying, uh, your parameters for your uh, whatever instrument you're using for drying, um, you know, make sure you're monitoring and, and you have quality instrumentation, uh, everything uh, that goes into the reference method. Because it is your control, it is, uh, it is of the utmost importance to uh, ensure that your reference method is uh, being performed as accurately as possible. Um, the next question uh, is, could you explain briefly how to correct the instruments based on the offset uh, correction? Uh, yes, so uh, um, I don't have an instrument here with me. Unfortunately, I'm, we're working from home uh, due to the quarantine, so I don't have an instrument physically with me. Um, uh, but essentially, it's just navigating a, uh, a series of menus on the instrument, uh, and then uh, from there, uh, you can uh, uh, essentially just change the number. There'll be a number input on the screen, and you can change that accordingly to whatever your uh, offset correction uh, is meant to be. And actually, uh, we have a really great tools to help you do this. I have, uh, we've created uh, uh, Excel workbooks that uh, allow you to input your data and it'll automatically calculate out um, any sort of uh, 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 offset that you, the new offset that you will have. And it'll also explain to you in that workbook, step-by-step, uh, -step, how to navigate the menus, what keystrokes to use to get to that specific menu for adjusting the offset calibration. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't have an instrument with me right now to demonstrate it, but um, if you do, if you are in, if you have an instrument and you need to change your offset and you want to know how to do that, please send me a message or please send me an email uh, or Eric an email and we will send you that uh, workbook to um, help you out with uh, doing your offset calibration. All right, the next questions are for Eric. So let's see here. Let's see. Uh, please, can you prepare in the future a uh, webinar about mango and another for fruit maps? Yeah, so we have presented one on mango. It is available on YouTube. Uh, I'll post the link to uh, the mango webinar. Uh, and we do have plans for a fruit maps webinar as well um, that'll go over um, how to use the at the fruit maps and the functionality of it. Uh, we can do a walkthrough of how to create plots, how to upload your data from your instrument to your fruit maps account, uh, and how you can easily export the data from fruit maps to an Excel worksheet as well. Uh, so stay on the lookout for that. Uh, we hope to, we typically do a webinar once a month. Um, and so, I would expect to have this webinar or host this webinar in the next couple of months. Uh, Gloria is asking, uh, para cualquier variedad de aguacate, so for those who don't speak Spanish, uh, she's asking um, for any variety of uh, avocado. And so our model incorporates Haas avocado as well as Shepherd. Uh, varieties. Um, all, uh, we don't have, uh, that's not to say that the, our meter won't work for other varieties. We just don't have any validation data to support that on our website. Um, Haas variety is the most uh, common variety that we have here in the States. And so we use that for our validation uh, analysis. Um, yeah. If, and in Spanish, um, el modelo no utiliza, bueno, utiliza solamente Haas y Shepherd, las variedades de Haas y Shepherd. Uh, no tenemos uh, datos de validación para cualquier otra variedad, pero eso no es por decir que no funciona con otra variedad, solamente que no tenemos validación. Um, right. You want to continue? Yeah, yeah thanks for that, Eric. Um, so the next question is, uh, 
high when doing multiple scans in single fruit, does the machine have the capability to compute the average of that fruit? So the answer to that question is uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, the machine actually does have the capability uh, to compute the average. Um, and uh, it, you, there is a menu. Once you have taken the measurements, there are menus that you can navigate uh, that will group together uh, um, based on your, org your organizational structure. Um, uh, it'll, it'll group together groupings of, of measurements and it'll show you averages of, the, of your measurements, standard deviation. Um, and, and so the yes, the machine uh, does calculate that for you. The next question is, can a dual model be put in the F-751? Uh, so no, the F-751 is intended only for uh, the, the, the model that we put on it for that single commodity. Um, uh, if you have uh, further questions, you can always uh, reach out uh, to me via email if you have uh, a specific need uh, that, uh, that we can uh, help you navigate. Um, I think Brenda might also be asking if it's a, a, double character, a dual characteristic model. Uh, oh, okay. Incorporated See, into that's why one. that's why we're both on this. So that you can uh, you can help my mind think clearly when I'm <laughs> when I'm obviously thinking of a totally different uh, uh, response. So yeah. Uh, so the kiwi fruit meter has uh, uh, bricks and dry matter built into it, um, uh, as well as the mango. The mango also does bricks and dry matter. The avocado we stuck with only dry matter because that is um, uh, the most commonly used. Uh, harvest maturity indicator um, and quality indicator um, because it correlates really highly with oil content. Um, but when we build models, uh, when uh, uh, when we first you know kind of conceptualize it, we 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 do our research to see which uh, uh, parameters or indicators are most important to that industry, uh, and so then we then we pursue those to to actually be built into the model. Um, so yes, so for that, and, and if that was the intent, then yeah, that, that it is possible. Gloria is asking, los agricultores necesitan recolectar la normativa cuando los aguacates, por ejemplo, has tienen 21% de materia seca. Un error de 2% puede hacer que no cumplan la normativa. ¿Se puede solucionar de alguna forma? Um, Si quieres, me puedes mandar un mensaje por correo y, uh, bueno, por ejemplo, el equipo siempre va a tener un porcentaje de error. También, al igual, los, un, un método tradicional. Eso siempre va, va a ser un, un una problema. Entonces, si sí puedes... Uh, reducir el error, pero para eliminarlo no nunca va a ser posible. Pero podemos hablar más de, sobre este tema si me quieres mandar un mensaje por correo y claro que sí, hablamos más sobre esto. Um, Gloria is asking, um, so at the moment of harvest, uh, Haas needs to have a 21% minimum dry matter uh, percentage. Uh, an error of 2% can make it where um, the lot fails. So is there a way to to fix this, correct this? Um, and I was mentioning that our instrument is always going to have an inherent um, error and just the same way as any traditional method uh, has one as well. Uh, you can, there's ways to minimize the uh, percent error uh, in, in sampling, but to eliminate all error is not possible. Uh, so again, consistency is key to all of any way that you test your avocados and um, to reduce the, the error percentage, but to eliminate all error is not possible. All right, thanks, Eric. The next question is, uh, can this machine work with table grape or wine grape? Uh, so again, uh, this, these F-751s are single commodity meters. Um, this F-750 
uh, is our research unit, which can be used for commodities that we have not built models for yet. Um, it does require the user to build their own models, but uh, we do not currently have a table grape or wine grape model built. Um, we have shown that it uh, is possible to use uh, the 750 for table grapes. Um, we have application notes on our website. I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, the next question is, could you explain the relationship between dry matter and oil content? Um, uh, so actually there is a really good resource uh, uh, that you should check out. It is um, uh, UC Davis has a the Post Harvest Research Center uh, has a, a, a thing called Produce Facts. Um, uh, and that is a great uh, resource to uh, look into. Um, but essentially it's, it's not a one-to-one uh, a, a -one relationship or anything like that. Um, but it is uh, essentially um, that uh, uh, higher dry matter uh, uh, is equal to higher oil content because there's less water. Uh, oil content is technically part of the dry matter measurement um, because it is not water. Um, and so uh, um, uh, higher dry matter, higher oil content, uh, higher um, you know, desirability or quality. Um, so that's that relationship. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, to determine the dry matter content by destructive methods, how many samples do you recommend per fruit? Um, uh, so for doing it by destructive methods, uh, uh, I would actually say that um, uh, what's uh, best if you want to get an idea for uh, the whole fruit is to um, get a representative sampling of all the flesh. And so there's multiple ways to do that. Some people use slices uh, from the avocado. Uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, take core samples. Um, uh, what I would recommend if you want to, uh, 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 you know, do cores, then you would want to take multiple cores from multiple locations in the fruit, probably, um, you know, at least uh, four locations. Um, but however, I think that at getting a, if you want the best whole fruit average, you, the ideal way is to sample all of the flesh um, uh, and, or at least, you know, a majority of it. I know that um, uh, some people also uh, use a minimum of like five grams uh, of flesh, uh, and that's a good way to you know make sure that you're utilizing as much as you can uh, without you know uh, causing the uh, experiment to uh, you know take forever. Uh, and so that's a good compromise. Um, but I, I would say you know uh, there isn't a exact number, but uh, I would say that um, it wouldn't be appropriate to only use, you know, a gram of the flesh or one or two core samples, um, depending on how big the core samples are, I suppose. But uh, uh, you want to at least get, uh, you know, a good representative sample. So if you were to open up that avocado and look at it, you would want to look at it after you have sampled it. You want to look at it and say, be able to say, yeah, that looks like it would represent, uh, you know, what the entirety of the fruit flesh would be. So, you know, multiple locations, so more than two locations, um, and uh, and ideally, uh, you know, more than a very small amount of flesh. You want flesh that ranges all the way from the seed all the way to the outside, to the rind. Um, uh, so that's what I would say to that. Um, uh, the next question I've already answered, it's how to calculate the prediction correction intercept. Uh, we're still on the same page. So it's just the average of the differences between the uh, instrument prediction and the reference method. And the next question is, can a significant amount of error be caused by variations in skin thickness within a commodity? Uh, working with apples, and I'm wondering how the measurements will vary between cultivars. Um, so actually, uh, 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 thickness uh, uh, only really plays a role if it's going to impede uh, the, the ability of the uh, lamp to penetrate into the flesh. Um, obviously, if it's, but uh, there are no apples that I can think of um, that are going, that have a thick uh, skin thick enough that would 
um, uh, cause any sort of uh, extreme variation. We are currently working on an Apple model um, uh, that is uh, and going to incorporate many, many uh, cultivars. Um, uh, and uh, actually, uh, if you wanted to talk about it more, um, I would recommend getting in touch with Eric. He's kind of heading that project. Um, uh, Eric, if you have more to say to that, you can feel free to jump in. But that's, I, I, from what I understand, um, uh, I, I there really I can't see a way that um, uh, you know any slight any variations in the skin thickness of an apple would really cause um, any issues for our instrument. Yeah, I don't anticipate um, variations in skin causing an issue. Uh, if it's multi if the model is multiple vari uh, varieties, different cultivars, then that uh, variation should be. Uh, built into the model uh, when the when the spectra is collected, so I think that would I don't think I don't anticipate that being an issue. Yeah. All right. The next question is: Do you do the correction for each device batch yourselves, <clears throat> or does the customer need to do it according to his or her reference? So that's what I was talking about earlier um, when I was talking about our current method. We do we do perform a a calibration for the offset. <clears throat> Uh, prior to shipping out, uh, we do it in-house. Right now, we're, we do it with the fruit, you know, on a batch-to-batch -batch basis. We buy fruit from our local markets, but we are currently changing that method um, to do some to a method where we will uh, reduce or uh, uh, ideally eliminate um, the variation between production batches. Um, uh, however, there are cases when, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, just differences in region or cultivar or, or whatever do uh, uh, cause the need for the customer to perform their own offset calibration. And so that's why uh, we presented this data to you today to show you that it is a powerful tool. If you notice your instrument, uh, you know, if you want your instrument to behave exactly to your current methods and with exactly your fruit, then it is, uh, uh, it is, uh, in your best interest to perform one of these offset calibrations. Uh, the next question is, uh, does the model uh, introduced in the instrument uh, been performed with a dry matter methodology in which water is completely eliminated? Um, from my experience, 24 hours in an oven is not enough time because of the high oil content of avocado. Um, so, uh, yes, so uh, 24 hours uh, is actually um, not typically what we, uh, we, we usually go 48 hours, uh, two days, um, four hours. Uh, I think I might have said 24 hours earlier, but I was, uh, I was thinking of, thinking of uh, kiwi fruit in my mind while talking about avocados likely. Um, so uh, uh, when we, uh, 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 you know, did the, a lot of the model, uh, the actual data in the model um, was collected uh, by our uh, um, friends and collaborators in uh, Mexico and Australia um, and, as, and then California as well. So uh, um, for the most part, uh, and they are, uh, you know, trusted researchers, scientists themselves, um, and their methodologies uh, uh, we are confident in, uh, we're able to, you know, fully eliminate water. Um, uh, however, that's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a false statement because uh, there's, you'll likely never truly eliminate all, all water, um, but that's kind of a, a subtle, uh, you know, uh, not subtlety, but I, uh, you know, I'm just kind of nitpicking there. But yeah, uh, so uh, we, we our, our data that's in the model is with, uh, and uh, as well as our validation, we do make sure that our, our methodologies, our destructive methodologies are working correctly um, uh, and, and working efficiently and working accurately. So um, I think I might've skipped a question on, on you there, Eric. Um, yeah, I posted uh, at the top for some reason. Uh, they can uh, go ahead and send me an email and I'll go ahead and help them with the support question. as a support question. Okay. If you guys have any specific questions about your instruments or support related things, uh, um, please uh, reach out to our support team, make a ticket uh, on our website. Um, we'll get to you on that. 
Um, uh, and then this next question is, is an offset correction enough for temperature effects? Uh, so our model does compensate internally for, uh, we did build in temp some temperature compensation. Um, the reason I mentioned the, you know, uh, the heating up of the fruit is that uh, our, our model compensates for temperature to the degree of, of what, you know, varying working conditions, but the lamp can heat that fruit up to, uh, you know, higher, even higher temperatures than what typical field or, you know, uh, storage conditions might be. So um, uh, the offset correction doesn't need to be done for temperature effects uh, for the avocado. Um, we're also currently working on uh, updating our kiwi fruit model to uh, to allow for temperature correction as well. Um, but uh, uh, if you are noticing, if you work in an, in an exceptionally cold environment or something like that, um, there may be, it may be that uh, a temperature or offset correction can help with uh, any sort of effects you might be seeing from that, that uh, temperature. Um, like I said, this offset correction, it can be, I mean, it can be tailored to your exact working environment. Um, and your technology, your fruit, your environment. Uh, for different types of avocado, uh, for example, Fuerte, could the F-751 be recalibrated? Um, so we do anticipate that. We don't have any data to support that claim yet, um, but we do anticipate that an offset correction could be used uh, in order to um, uh, 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 use the 751 avocado model on uh, other types of like tropical varieties or, or, or things of that nature. So uh, we uh, are optimistic and are hopeful about that possibility. Um, I don't have any data to support that claim though. Uh, the next question is following up from the question, if it is best to measure on the tree, do you expect the spectra to be different if you measure on the tree versus right after picking the fruit? Um, uh, so uh, I don't anticipate uh, there being uh, that much of a difference. Uh, the only difference uh, differences that would arise are those that uh, you know would arise uh, depending on how long of a time span that is between being on the tree or or being picked. Um, uh, so if you were measuring on the tree uh, and then you picked the fruit and then you waited, uh, uh, you know, especially a long time, like a day or, or a couple hours then there likely might still be a difference because the fruit is still physiologically changing. Um, if you're asking that if you were to measure the fruit on the tree or pick it and then measure it at the same time point, um, there might be very, very small differences, but likely not, likely not too much of a difference there. All right, the next question is, which method for dry matter is used by the company to create the reference values? Uh, depends on the fruit. Uh, so with avocado, uh, we are currently using the dehydrator. Um, uh, we were previously using the microwave method. Um, however, we uh, noticed uh, some bias with the microwave method, uh, just um, the automatic microwave system that we had. Uh, uh, its ability to, you know, dry without burning was fairly limited. Its, its power settings were just a little bit too high. Um, uh, and so, uh, we, we switched back to the dehydrator method. Um, and then for kiwi fruit, it's also a dehydrator. Uh, and then I think mango, actually, we also use the dehydrator now because uh, the kiwi and mango both are, are pretty susceptible, susceptible to burning. Uh, so you can't really use the microwave. Um, uh, however, so uh, that's what we do right now. Uh, that's something that's gonna be completely changed here soon. We're looking into new ways to perform this calibration to increase the consistency between batches and, and reduce that variation between production batches. The next question is, what is Fruit Maps? Uh, Fruit Maps is an application uh, that is used alongside the 751. Um, it's used for harvest tracking. Uh, we are currently making updates to it. Um, and that's what Eric was talking about earlier uh, with one of the questions. Uh, so uh, we do have more information on it on our website if you want to check it out. Um, it is, uh, it's basically just an app that you upload your 751 data to uh, and it will allow you to track your harvest more efficiently. Um, the next question is what instrument will you suggest for a determination of maturity in plum and peaches? 
Um, I would recommend the 750. However, we do not have a model built for plum and peaches, so you would have to uh, build that model yourself prior to being able to use it in a non-destructive way. Um, uh, the next question is if I want to scan Haas, a uh, thick skin and, and um, uh, a thinner skin avocado, can I use two different models in one device for avocado? So uh, you're saying that you want two, essentially you want two model, a model that is specific to a cultivar. Uh, you want a, a, a thin skin avocado uh, a model and a, and a Haas model. Um, so we only, we uh, ideally, if, if there, uh, what we are hoping to have is a singular model that can predict all of them, uh, regardless of skin thickness. And um, uh, we're hoping that uh, with the addition of more data into our model that there will be no need for the two different models in one device. Um, but if you want to talk about it further, uh, we can uh, uh, discuss it more over email if you want to email uh, Eric or myself. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, what about variations in avocado skin thickness? Um, so uh, yeah, going back to that, uh, that also shouldn't play too much of a factor in um, uh, the uh, instrument's ability to read. Uh, the one thing is that the, a thinner skin uh, does allow better penetration of the light, which uh, uh, could be good. It could be bad if if your if if your uh, seed is really large and uh, your thin your skin is really thin, then um, you can uh, run the risk of accidentally you know getting uh, variants from from the light um, hitting the seed. Uh, so uh, it really um, uh, the 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 skin thickness shouldn't influence the model's ability to predict. However, it will just due to the fact that um, uh, 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 the fact that there are some other possibilities like that seed situation. Um, also, reducing the amount of ridges for like smooth skin avocados um, uh, uh, that actually makes it easier for the for the instrument. It, it reduces variation. So. Um, really, truly, Haas is is one of the more difficult, you know, uh, fruits uh, to to utilize this instrument with. Um, but we've we've you know by creating this robust model, we've managed to overcome that a lot of that variation that's caused by the fruit itself. And the user can overcome a lot of it just with the technique involved um, with with performing the scans. So um, I think. Uh, uh, with that being said, there are, you know, we have not, don't have any data to support, um, uh, you know, other, vari other varieties that aren't built into the model. Um, uh, however, you know, we hope to soon have uh, uh, some good data on that. We do have collaborators currently working on um, projects looking at other cultivars of avocados. So, and I think that's the last question. For all of you that are still on, I applaud you. Thank you for sticking with us through all those questions. Um, if you have a question that uh, is more specific to uh, your situation, uh, you can always uh, book a consultation with us or, or email Eric or myself um, directly. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you, uh, you know, need a quote for an instrument, go ahead and click the link for the quote or, or contact our sales department. If you need help, uh, if you already own one or if you need help with an application, talk to Eric or myself via email or, or book a consultation at the link below and we'll get back to you. So thanks again for taking your time out of your busy day to join us. Uh, I see we still have 45 people on, so I really appreciate it. This will be recorded uh, and sent out to you, as Eric mentioned, and um, we also will have the PowerPoint uh, posted as well. So uh, thank, thank you everybody. all. And uh, Eric, do you have any closing remarks too? Uh, no, um, just again, if you have any email questions, um, I shared the, both of our emails in the chat box. Um, Bridget, I wanted to mention that uh, I'll send you the email about dry matter and oil content uh, relationship and that's it all right well thanks again everybody and i hope you are all staying safe and healthy and i hope uh um that uh you know 
for you in the produce industry that things continue to to go well with the produce industry and and that uh and that you you know continue to stay busy without going too crazy um so thanks again everyone and have a great day